welcome to another episode of What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? I am your host, Karen E. Osborne. Hopefully you know me well by now. You've been following us and enjoying all the interviews. And I love it when I bring somebody back. You know, somebody who you met and, and our guest today, you met her two years ago. And it's just so wonderful to re-engage with people that you've met before. Uh, so Jill Cogarty. Yes. Did I get that right? Jill? You got it, Karen. Perfect. You nailed it. <laughs> is is an amazing writer. Uh, Jill, say hi to everybody. Hi. Thank you for having me, Karen. Oh, I'm so glad to have you. And I just, I just finished reading her book. And I don't always get to do that with the people that I interview. Sometimes I read it after uh, I meet them. And I think, oh, that book sounds so interesting. I better go get it. But I had the pleasure of reading Jill's book before this interview. And it's called The View from the Half Dome. And it launches in just a few days. And we're just so happy. I can't wait to hear you, Jill, tell us all about it. Tell us about your process. Tell us about your launch plans, everything. So hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. And I can't wait to talk about this amazing, amazing book because I loved it. I fell in love with it. Start telling everybody about your book. So let's, let's hear the premise. Start from there. Sure, sure. So um, the view from Half Dome takes place in 1934. It's the height of the Depression. Um, it starts in San Francisco. And Isabel is a young 16-year-old girl, actually, whose family has come upon very hard times. Her father has recently died. He was a longshoreman. Um, and her mother has been forced to find work as a maid. Her brother, her older brother, is it, serving with the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps at Yosemite. So Isabel is home. Uh, she's She attends high school, but she also has to take care of her younger sister, Audrey, when her mother is at work. So she's juggling a lot of responsibilities. She's, um, she's holding down a part-time job at a grocer. She's taking care of her sister. And then she's also editing the paper when she can at, at her high school. Um, she really longs for some freedom. She's, it's just a lot for a girl her age to handle. And she's, she's tried to be creative and come up with ideas to help her sister, who's also suffering, you know, to find some, some solace through a, an imaginary world. But she really has the need to, to escape. So she comes up with an, she actually does make a plan to get some time alone. Um, unfortunately, it leads to some tragic consequences. There's a horrible accident and she, her mother becomes extremely bitter and depressed and Isabel decides she has to flee the city and um, she wants to go to her older brother at Yosemite. Um, she does make it to Yosemite with the help of a friend uh, once she gets there, she finds that she cannot stay. She hadn't really thought things through She, in her desperation to get away. And um, she is lucky enough to be able to temporarily stay with uh, Enid Michael, who is the first female and actually only female ranger naturalist at Yosemite at the time, and her husband, because Enid has a public wildflower garden that some of the CCC boys help her with. So Isabel convinces Enid to let her stay a little longer. She's enchanted by Yosemite. Isabel take, or Enid takes Isabel under her wings and teaches her some new skills like birds, plants, animals, flowers, um, how to help with nature walks, how to garden in the public wildflower garden and, and go on hikes. Um, Isabel is starting to imagine a new life at Yosemite. Um, unfortunately, in she, meanwhile, she's able to see her brother from time to time. She's, he's working there, um, with the CCC. Um, but then she has kept her, uh, the, the whole accident, a secret from Enid. And she has her, she's very, she has guilt too, that she doesn't want to share. So she's hiding some things. Um, 
when so, she, so maybe we shouldn't yeah. tell the whole plot no. <laughs> <laughs> right maybe i'll leave it at that <laughs> and just say she has some some challenging news she gets from home that that puts her at a crossroads about what she's going to do next yeah, but she yeah, has to I figure don't want to out. Give yes, <laughs> she has a lot of things to figure out. Carrying a secret and lots of things to figure out. So, is it? So, would you call this historical YA, young adult, or did you write it for adults? Because as an adult, I I enjoyed it immensely. But was your your reader in mind a young person? Originally, it was not a young person. Originally, it was meant to be an adult novel. Um, and it is, it, and, but I found that it is working for YA audiences. My own daughter, who's 15, um, read it. So I was happy about that. And I, I've seen some comments also from early readers that it could work for a YA audience. Originally, I have to say the novel had a much longer section in San Francisco. It was much darker, much more... Mm adult heavy. And I, I had to cut a lot of that down to get to the heart of the story, get the inciting incident out of the way. So originally, um, I only intended for an adult audience, but I'm seeing now because yeah. of the character age, it works for YA audiences too. So it's the kind of been coming happy. of age, right? It, it has yes. a lot of a coming of age um, exactly. aspects to it. And yet it, it's it's very, like a lot of YA, is quite entertaining for adults. You know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. And I've been pleasantly surprised to see that, um, that it, it hopefully does kind of span those two audiences well, you know, that it could work for YA and adults at the same yeah, time. Yeah, I think it does. I think that, I'm glad to hear that you have, if your 15-year-old daughter thinks it was really good, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you, one of the things that hooked me when I was first, when I picked up the book was I really loved the character Isabel and I, I, I cared about her and what was going to happen to her. What would you say are some of her strengths and some of her weaknesses? You know, because our, our characters are not perfect. And sure. yeah, so how would you talk about her as a person? Because that's what she is, a real person. Right. Yes. She, Isabel is, um, she's a bookish 16 year old girl. Um, she is shy, but she has a very strong will, I guess you would say some, somewhat of a stubborn, strong mm. will and personality. Um, she, she loves poetry. She actually shares the surname with, um, last surname with Emily Dickinson and likes her poems like her late father did too. Um, she's also creative in that she is able to come up with this imaginary world to kind of help her younger sister. Um, and, I, and then I guess I would say she's she's resilient. Um, mm. In the face of difficulty, she she's coming up with some plans. She's coming up with ideas to, you know, get through to get to the next um, stage of her life. So yeah. I yeah, think resilience that, and grit. She has some grit. Yes. Yeah. Even yeah. Just kind of survive and get through. Yes. So um you're writing in the in the Great Depression is, is the setting. And you're also and we also end up being in Yosemite. We end up being in this beautiful um naturalist park. How how did you do the research? Did you research prior to were you calling on some of your own experiences did you research as you were going kind of tell us what your process is yeah so I did almost all of the research ahead of time and I was um you know for my last book which was also also set in the depression I was really interested in the CCC in um at national parks and through that reason, I want I knew I wanted to do something involving the CCC. But when I was researching the CCC at Yosemite, that's when I discovered Enid Michael. And she just sounded like such a fascinating character. I just had to include her. Said she's the first female ranger naturalist. She's mm -hmm. she was a climber, an avid climber without ropes with her husband. She had to, she faced um some opposition from her supervisor, her male supervisor, who thought that. 
um, like the CCC boys would be supervised better by a male, a man, and she had to reapply yearly for her position. But anyway, I, I found um, some, once I started researching her, I found a couple of out of print books and I had to go on Amazon and I paid <laughs> some <laughs> crazy amount to get a couple of them that one was called um, the, the Joy of Yosemite Pioneer uh, Enid Michael's writings. And it had been compiled by a man uh, who was a professor, I think, somewhere in Southern California, and he also loved Yosemite, but he put together some of her nature writings. She had submitted articles about birds, about squirrels and plants, and and so I could kind of glimpse, get glimpses of her personality. She anthropomorphized a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And then the same man wrote Yosemite in the 30s, A Remembrance, and it was also an out-of-print book, but it showed you know, some of the, the traditions that were available at Yosemite in the 30s, like the firefall, which, and feeding bears, which of course they never do today. <laughs> um, and just, you know, some of the other things, like they didn't drink water on hikes. They believed you shouldn't do that because you, your belly would get too full, <laughs> things mm -hmm. like that. And um, so anyway, I just collected a lot of this information in a file I had been to Yosemite once before, but it was many years ago. And the irony is I have not been able to return since the oh. pandemic. I have been trying <laughs> and we are supposed to be going, um, except that it's in a snowstorm right now. So it might not even happen. But anyway, three times. You'll get there. You will get there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yeah, I, I, all of the research pretty much I've done, you yeah. know, ahead of time by organizing by subject. Yeah. Um, yeah. I had to, you know, uh, I too have books out of print that I mm -hmm. uh, used for uh, my upcoming historical fiction book, True Grace. But I also had to research on the, you know, as I was writing, you know, I'm writing and I, and I put down, I um, mean, you know, oh, uh, what kind of a shopping cart would they have? Was aluminum invented in 1912? Oh, shoot, now I gotta go find out. What, you know, <laughs> would they have an aluminum shopping cart? Cause I had, it was like a little tiny thing. It wasn't like a big piece of a scene, but all you gotta yeah. do is have one wrong, Oh, you yeah. know, and then it just throws out those. Of anachronism. <laughs> <laughs> You're okay. right. I did have some of those too, where I would mark a note and say, make sure the cup of coffee, it cost five cents or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how much did things cost there? I had to figure out how much uh, my character's husband was making a year. You know, I had to and find out the, the salary exactly. because it was, it was relevant to, um, to the story and Oh, I don't think I'll ever write another history. I I my hat <laughs> tips to you because I don't think I'll ever write another historical <laughs> fiction book. I like just making yeah. stuff up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of blending the fa facts and fiction is my favorite part because when you get if you feel like you have to s stick too much to the facts, that's in terms of the, of the yeah. bias of the people. That's yeah, it can it can really uh, slow stop you. It makes yeah. it hard to. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, your launch is in just a couple of days, which I'm so excited. So do you have things planned and anything that our audience could participate in or find it, you know, just be part of your excitement of your launch? Yeah, um, I'm going to be doing, uh, well, I have a blog tour with Susie's approved books. So that'll be coming out um, right after the launch for the next few days after that. It's going to be running, I think, a month. And then, um, so I have, I, I'm actually doing, unlike my last book, which was right in the height of the pandemic, I, I did a virtual, kind of a virtual launch there. I actually am going to be at a local bookstore in Chapel Hill, North Carolina for this launch on, um, it'll be on April 25th. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, and then I'm also, I, there will be a book bub new release deal for this coming out and an audio book. I'm so excited that oh. Teresa Bakken has decided to, has graciously recording um, The View from Half Dome. She's affiliated with Black Rose Writing uh, authors. And um, then I'll be posting on social media. I'd love for everyone to follow me on, you know, social media and 
I'll, I'm sending out, I'll be sending out a newsletter too. I, on my website, jillcogarty.com, there's a place to sign up for the newsletter. So I'll be doing all the social media stuff, but those are the main things I've got planned right That's now. Really good. Susie's um, book tour, approved book tour, I've done twice. I did it for Tangled Lives. Yeah. And then I did it for Reckonings. And yes. she really does. Uh, she does a, she, she finds great bloggers and they're, um, you know, and they write a really thorough review and it's all on Instagram, people. You got to go on Instagram to find it. Uh, but that sounds really good. That sounds like a great, a great step. Are you working on, I know it's so hard, you know, your, your marketing and you're your still, oh, tell us the name of your first book so everyone knows. Oh, yes. It's Waltz and Swing Time. Um, and it's set in the 1930s also at a different, kind of a different national park, Zion National Park instead of Yosemite. But it's all, it's not, it, most of the action is, takes place outside Zion. Yeah. So yeah, I, I'm, I might be known as the National Park Depression, <laughs> 1930s <laughs> National Park author. That's right. So are you working on anything new? I actually am. I'm, I'm doing a contemporary novel. Um, it's, mm. it's a fictional, it's set around, I used to work in tech. So it's set around a fictional tech startup. Um, based in North Carolina, so with headquarters in San Jose, California. <laughs> so mm, it cool. centers around four different people at the startup, um, and it's been it's gone through beta readers. Um, I have a South Asian sensitivity reader because there is there are some South Asian characters in it, and now I'm I'm going to try to incorporate all the feedback and probably go through maybe one more beta reader after that too. And my critique partners have been you know, looking at my revisions. So it's been a, a slow process, but I love it. I just love, you know, diving into it and completely different actually from what I've what done. done in the past. Yeah, yeah. That's, so, that's so cool. It helps us grow, right? It helps us grow as writers to try to try new things. That sounds yeah, really exactly. good. So good books, because we're both readers and and pretty much everybody who watches this is a, is a reader. Uh, when, can you think of a book that you read either as a child, as an adult, doesn't matter when, that just really had such an impact on you in a personal way? It affected your life in some way or affected your writing in some way? Yeah, and I, there are many, I would have to say. But my first, it, I was six years old when my mother started reading the Little House on the Prairie series by um, Laura, Laura Eagles Wilder. To me, and that's when at that age I loved those books so much I wanted to become a writer. I knew it took me a very long time to become a writer, <laughs> like you know, 50 years after that, but or almost 50. But um, yeah, it that was very influential to my early days of writing. And then um Wallace Stegner's Angle of Repose had a big impact on me. He also writes in the about the West, and this mm. it's a historical novel. Um, kind of also it well I won't say also dual timeline but his is dual timeline and it was a very well done um, story and then I love like Amy Tan, Jane Smiley yes. um, mm. yeah um, all of the even Michael Cunningham's The Hours is another one that features Virginia Woolf and some characters in it like that so that's a brilliant yeah. brilliant book yeah yeah, yeah so many yeah. Um, universities use it as a teaching tool you know they assigned reading well I was surprised to to hear uh, I mean I don't listen to opera but I happen to have NPR on and I I it, they were playing an opera about based on the hours from the Met it was just happened to be in a you know it's like whoa this is pretty amazing <laughs> yeah that the really is. Mountain is another one that was made into an opera by Charles Brazier and I love that book too <laughs> Wow, wouldn't be, you know, I'd love one of my books to be made into a movie, but an opera, wow. <laughs> what are the uh, chances? <laughs> yeah, what are the chances, chances of that? Uh, so you named quite a few authors that you love. Is there any particular book that you've recently read that you can recommend to our audience? Yes, uh, there are two really good books I've recently read. I just finished reading Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. Amazing book. We love it's her. We love her. <laughs> I do too. I loved the Poisonwood Bible, and this one I think is her best. And it's it's a modern 
retelling of David David Copperfield, but it really exposes the opioid epidemic and shows um, and exposes the the failings of the foster care system. And you know, kind of in an area of the Appalachia that's been rural area overlooked that really was decimated during the opioid crisis. So I was I was blown away by the book, especially because she's a 60 year old, 67 year old author writing about a teenage boy, you know, and using the vernacular. Yeah. And it was it worked. And it was like it was almost like reading Catcher in the Rye, a modern day version in terms of that voice. Amazing, amazing book. You know, she really does voice so well in the yeah. in the uh, Poisonwood Bible. She had four characters and one of them was a five-year-old yes and I never had to guess who was speaking or who, whose yeah. point of view I was in because she captured those voices oh my goodness I admire yeah. her so much I'm, I'm striving for that <laughs> it's a long read you know but don't be daunted by it it took me a, a little while but it's worth it it's worth um, it all right thank you so much for a great um list of possibilities right everybody <laughs> And just repeat for everybody what your website is and uh, and so, and your and where they can sign up for your newsletter and just really sure. be in touch. Sure. So my website is www.jillcogherty.com. And there's a place there that where you can sign up with, for the newsletter. Um, and then, you know, it's also, uh, you can follow me on Instagram, also Jill Cogarty, and then Facebook. I have both a personal and an author page on Facebook and on Twitter for as long as that lasts. Anyway. Yes, for as long as that lasts. <laughs> exactly right. We're hanging in there, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> I hope you have enjoyed this conversation with Jill and that you will follow her on Instagram and on her. Facebook author page, and you'll uh, like her um, website, go visit her website. I hope that you are following me on Instagram and Facebook on my author page and my YouTube channel as well, and, uh, and my website. And we hope you will come back next week, the next episode of What Are You Reading? What Are You Writing? Take care, everybody.